nowadays, like we're actually in like a testosterone decline. It's like young males we're seeing in like in their 20s. And it's like, well, why? It's like we look, we got to look at the, the foods we're eating a lot more processed or heating up plastics. Like if you're heating up your food, drinking from plastic water bottles, a lot of times people are going for the quick results. They want to be seeing those results of, you know, two, three pounds a week, which it's not impossible. But the problem that, you know, you're going to run into Broken home, broken dreams. Gave my mind to these millions and my heart to the guy. Probably die up in these streets, but I survived through my name. Welcome back to the Broken Home Podcast. Hope you're all having a great week. I was at the supplement store a couple weeks back and I actually started talking with the guy there. His name's Mike. We got on about talking about fitness and his journey and I wanted to bring him on to help educate some of the listeners about how to achieve their goals in fitness and and just generally living a healthy lifestyle with that being said let me welcome mike Peloza. how you doing tonight bro doing fantastic thank you guys so much for having me it's been uh been a few weeks since we uh last spoke but you know when you mentioned the opportunity to come on and share my journey and hopefully uh you know whoever's listening to inspire a few people to you know even turn their life around or just achieve a healthier lifestyle altogether i just started getting back into it i used to be a pro fighter i made mark puke a few times when i had him train with me that was the and, warm-up uh, <laughs> <laughs> that'll that'll happen you know, yeah. good for sure <laughs> yeah and uh i'm getting back into it i'm so excited to be back into it and, and just relearning all the all the little tips and and supplement facts and ideas and stuff like that from before and, and just getting right back into the full swing of things. How long have you been working out for now? Uh, so I'm going on about my ninth year of training, actually. So I, I started in my basement. My, my mom and my dad had got me a, a weight bench for my, uh, I think, 16th birthday. It was one of those benches, you know, set of dumbbells and a barbell. And at first I didn't touch it because I was like, I was intimidated. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to know what to do. But then I kind of got out of my head. I'm like, it's at my house, right? Like, who's watching me? Who's watching me, right? It's a, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, it just, you know, it came from YouTube. I would just, you know, YouTube best dumbbell at home exercises, so to speak. And I remember, you know, there's something called the newbie gains. So even though it was just like home workouts, when you shock the body into that kind of new stimulus, I, I saw results fairly quickly. You know, even if it was just at home, like within my first like three months, I, you know, people noticed, I noticed. And then I think from that point forward, you know, once I turned 17 and I was old enough to actually get a gym membership, that's when I just went like full steam ahead. Like this is something I, I want to pursue. And at first, you know, of course, your your friends, you know, they saw me doing it. They're like, oh, we, we want to join you. So they got memberships. I think they maybe only lasted like a month or two. Um they, they just couldn't understand the, the discipline that went into, you know, we were, we were in high school at the time we were going to be graduating and they couldn't understand like, man, on a Saturday night, you're studying for exams, you're prepping your food. We want to go out and party kind of thing. So I, I think there's a very uh, big aspect to the discipline side of things when it comes to achieving those fitness goals. So yeah, all in all been training about eight, nine years now. Well, that's impressive. Nice. What was it that uh, that made you start? You you got that the the barbells, things like that. Like, were you overweight as a younger kid? I was talking to Jason about this. I said, "Am I the ideal candidate for the show?" Because I had an awesome upbringing. You know, great great parents, really great opportunities growing up. But uh, the way I kind of got started was I had expressed an interest to, in bodybuilding and just fitness to my parents in general. Like, wow, this is this is so cool how people are able to achieve these physiques, and then. I was bullied quite a bit in high school, like a lot, you know, grade, uh, grade 11 was a nightmare for me. And I remember I, I knew I kind of needed something after school, especially like, what can I do to better myself and, you know, kind of ex- get this anger out in a way, right. From being bullied. And then I remember a year went by and people who, you know, were the ones to bully, they were like, wow, like you're working out, it's paid off. So I think that's what got me started. And then what kept me going was the discipline that took took over in other aspects of my life. So, you know, in high school, it was, it was gym, it was studying. Cause I, you know, I wanted to go to university, get my degree. So all that discipline in the gym, you know, those early mornings that all transferred over to the books. You know, a lot of people look at fitness as this one sided thing and it, it is what you make of it. If that's what you want to do great, but having that discipline in the gym, it transferred all throughout university. You know, it was like gym study exams, 
go train. And then I did my first show when I was 19 out of town. And, you know, I I made every mistakes in the books uh, for first contest prep, but just seeing like those changes you can make in your body, that's kind of what kept me going and now working in the supplement industry. Just so our, our audience don't get intimidated, you don't have to go out to try to be uh, doing shows or anything like that. It, no. it's, it's just, it, it's for the health of it, for your personal health of it, your personal well being and everything, just the, the, the fitness side and the shows that was the aspect that you chose to pursue, I guess. Correct. Yeah. At that time, like I haven't done one, you know, for five years. Cause like, you know, you talk about health and fitness and it, it's such a very broad range. Cause you know, there's a point where it's yet say someone gets too obese. Okay. That's unhealthy. But then there's also a point of being too lean, which I got to, which is also extremely unhealthy. So there should be that like finite balance of, yeah, you want to look good, but how are you performing mentally? Are you, you know, cause I'll be the first to say when you get leaner, you know, you're going to get that brain fog. You're going to get fatigued quicker. Your strengths in a decline. So you got to really ask yourself, is it worth it? If you, if you're trying to be Mr. Olympia and you want to compete this weekend, Props to, you know, that's the career path you chose. But I think for the average person, just living a well-rounded lifestyle of, you know, a balanced diet, not cutting foods you love, because that's the recipe for rebound and binging and just this, it's like a, it's a vicious loop that these people fall on, right? You know, you always hear every year, it's, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to start January 1st. They, they go on these strict meal regimens for two months. They deprive themselves of everything they want. And then what happens on month three? They regain all that weight back. And then it's, it's like a discouragement. So I think by having balance, you know, if I want to go eat pizza or wings with friends or something, cool, I'm going. But by having that kind of balance, it just, it really allows you to just still live a, a overall wellness lifestyle, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know the answer to this, but just so our audience, how important is diet when it comes to, to do working out? I don't want to say it's like a, 70%, you know, nutrition, 30% training. Cause you could have a, you could have a perfect diet, but be training really poorly, you know, not training hard, probably not going to see results. You could be training like an absolute, you know, maniac in the gym, but be eating poorly. You're not going to see results. So it, it's super important for whatever your goal might be. So if someone's trying to build muscle, they're going to want to eat more. If someone's trying to lose weight, they're going to want to be in a deficit. But this is a point I wanted to touch on because, you know, working at Popeye's, working with so many different people, is the number one question I get asked is like, well, you did a cut recently and how, how come you're still eating foods you enjoy? And it's because I tell people it's not so much about the foods, it's about how much. So if I can make it, it's about how much, right? Like if, if I can yeah. on this cut, I still had Barbarito some days and people were like, you, you're eating that and you're losing weight still, you're getting leaner, like how be well how is because i make it fit my macros and i'm still in a caloric deficit uh, the deficit's the deficit so people are shocked that there's they're shocked to hear there's no magic foods you know chicken broccoli and rice six times a day mm-hmm. if you can stick to that and you enjoy eating that great but i that's what i did at one point in my life but i knew if it was something i wanted to continue long term continue for longevity and health i knew i had to get out of that you know six meals this, this, and this, I had, I had to get away from that. The human body, it burns. Like, well, I think it was something like 2,200 calories a day. So is it as long as you're under that, that you're going to be losing weight or do you have to have specifics? Yeah. So, you know, everyone's total daily energy expenditure is going to be different. So that's going to be based on whether you're male or female, you know, your height, your activity level. So if someone's super active and they have a really active job, they're going to have a higher total daily energy expenditure. So when I did all my calculations for my cut, my, my daily maintenance calories. So for me, Mike Pelosa to maintain my weight at this height, I would need 29, 2,900 to 3000 calories a day to maintain. Now, if I wanted to gain, I'm going to be eating in a surplus of three to 500. Now for me to lose, if I'm below that 2,900, so if I'm eating 2,600, I'm going to lose weight. Also, another thing you got to look at is the rate of weight loss. So a lot of times people are going for the quick results. They want to be seeing those results of, you know, two, three pounds a week, which it's not impossible. But the problem that, you know, you're going to run into, the leaner you are and the quicker you try to lose weight, the more muscle mass you're going to lose as well. Because the body does not want to be, especially when you're doing it naturally. Okay. There's so many different peptides and stuff on the market we could get into if time permits. But the leaner you get, 
the body doesn't want to hold on to that mass. It's going to eat some muscle too. So, you know, when people, you know, ask about fat loss and, and rate of fat loss, generally I keep it very conservative. I don't recommend losing more than 1.3 pounds a week, even 1.2, you know, cause people, they, they want to lose it so quick. I want to, I want to lose 30 pounds in 12 weeks. It's like, sure. Is it doable? Yeah. But are you going to feel good? Absolutely not. Exactly. And, and maintaining that balance between yes. what is good for you and how and what's harming you is is it's quite the fine tuning i'd imagine as well absolutely like years of trial and error you know different supplements different protocols like different timing of nutrients like okay you know an hour and a half before my workout i'm gonna maybe eat more carbohydrates and then less throughout the day nothing wrong with eating carbs throughout the day if you're in a deficit like there's that whole stigma of oh if you're trying to lose weight and you eat carbs in the evening before bed it's like there used to be that thing, no carbs after 6 p.m. And it's like, what are you going to turn into like a pumpkin at 601 because you had some sweet potato? It's like, if you're in a deficit and you want your last meal to have some carbs in it, go for it because you're probably going to sleep better because there's nothing worse than going to bed hungry as hell because I can't have carbs at my last meal of the day. So there's fine tuning, but you, you got to have a point where it's like, okay, am I being excessive with it or am I making the necessary adjustments? Mike, how long have you been working with uh, supplements? And when you started working out, how long until you started incorporating supplements into your routine? For sure. So I've actually only been in the, the supplement industry as a career uh, for just over a year now, actually. So I always knew that was my calling, like right after high school, like I said, I did the university and everything. But I all like I remember fourth year university just sending out resumes to these big supplement companies. Like, you know, I'm in my last year university. This is what I want to do. Actually working in the industry that I knew was my calling just over a year now. Um, and then in terms of incorporating supplements, I started incorporating like the basics fairly early on. So I want to say within six months of training, that's when I got on like, you know, the creatine, the protein. And then of course, when I was in high school, it was like, the big talk was, oh, C4 pre-workout. If you're not taking C4, you're, so I remember going, going to the GNC and like, you got to spend my $80 on C4. Now, you know, you live and you learn from your mistakes, but I think there's the necessary supplements. Then I think there's the sexy supplements if you can add them into your budget. Mm -hmm. And what yeah. would you say is uh, in the supplement industry, I hear a lot about like tainted supplements and, and like, how does it, how does it work for, for you to make sure that all the supplements that are coming in are clean and for sure. So in Canada, actually, we have a lot more regulatory uh, laws of what can come in and be sold. So I'll just give you the caffeine example, because that's probably the, the best and easiest example for viewers to understand in the States. If, if you look at a pre-workout, it's kind of like the wild west down there. They're, they're not really regulated. So a lot of these, you know, stimulants are loaded with caffeine, but they're including ephedrine. They're including things like DMAA, which is a very strong focus agent. And I do think that when it's dosed correctly, it can be very effective. The problem is people go overboard because once you get that feeling of euphoria in the gym, you're feeling more focused and you're just like energized all day to get all your tasks done. That's where it goes excessive. Now, bringing it back to what's allowed in Canada, uh, Popeyes obviously um, works with Health Canada, so we have rules as uh, to what we're allowed to sell. Uh, in terms of you know supplements being tainted, so to speak, I know back in 2007, uh, this was more so in the U.S. There was a huge ban on pro hormones, uh, which is a supplement that people say, well, it's not a steroid, so th they're fine because it was sold at the GNC. Essentially, what was happening was the methylation technique. Now methylation is simply what the product is coated in it's not the actual drug it was winding people in the hospital with liver damage so those got pulled from the shelves so i think over the last you know 10 15 years the supplement industry has become a lot safer do i think there's still products you know maybe in some mom and pop shops that shouldn't be sold absolutely but i think when you're working with big retailers like you know popeyes gnc in the states you're you're in pretty good hands yeah, I, I, I've noticed that a lot of supplements that are really popular in the States, you can't even order here to Canada because of the FDA regulation. They yeah, have so a banned it, some to su substance in it. So the, it's, it's interesting how the FDA works. That's the Food and Drug Administration, which is in the States. So they govern all the supplement laws in the U.S. Health Canada, on the other hand, just governs yeah. Canada. So the FDA is a lot more um, lackluster 
have you will. So the way the FDA works, a lot of times you'll see in the States on a supplemental say not FDA approved. So until a complaint or a, a, you know, a formal file is actually filled out against that supplement, the FDA doesn't touch it. So, you know, you got these pre-workouts in the States until someone has a severe negative reaction, it's approved. It's, it's still on the shelf. But then once someone files a complaint, that's when the FDA is going to step in, do their investigating. M1Ts, methylated one testosterone was really big for, for uh, guys like us that were training and, and wanted that extra edge, but were also prone to being piss tested as well. So right. methylated one testosterone would actually, uh, some for some reason, I guess it wasn't tested for or something. I'm not sure how, but a lot of the guys that were doing the fighting were actually taking this and it was getting, they were getting through it. But uh, with Health Canada, they banned that methylated one testosterone because of people getting liver issues, I guess. Yeah. So the, the, the main thing with those, it's, you know, a lot of people think it's the specific supplement. They, they want to say, Oh, it's the pro hormone causing liver damage. It's not so much the actual pro hormone. Like if, if you take, you know, like a one testosterone or something, it's not the one testosterone because all that's doing is it's converting to testosterone in the body, right? So it's giving you essentially more testosterone. It's working with your hypothalamus, it's giving you more testosterone, which is going to be beneficial. So it's not so much, it's not the conversion that's causing the liver damage. It's the coding. It's the one methylation that they're using. So all those pro hormones got banned. Like you can't sell them in the States anymore. You can't get those anywhere. And for good reason, like, you know, it's it, okay. You take this supplement for eight weeks. Now you got a failing liver kind of thing. So they do, they do still make pro hormones. Um, I'm not real. I'm not against them or anything. But the thing now is if a company wants to sell them, they have to prove that it's non-methylated. Oh, okay. And I yeah. guess that Popeyes has a very stringent testing grounds. Like you have to meet certain requirements to be able to be sold at, at your stores. Yeah. So basically Health Canada, it's not so much like specific products. It's more so product category. So if you notice energy drinks in the States, I was just in the States not too long ago, actually. If you go to Ryden's, you look, you look at a can of Rockstar from there. It's like 320 milligrams of caffeine per can. It, it's nuts. In Canada, though, for instance, with Popeye's, any other store, we are not allowed to distribute any energy drink with over 180 milligrams of caffeine. It cannot exceed that. So for a while, um, I don't know if anyone knows anyone knows 3D Energy. That was a big fitness influencers brand. 3D Energy it was a good drink. It had 200 milligrams of caffeine. And initially it got passed. Health Canada missed it somehow. They were just like, oh, yeah, it's another one of these ones. But what's interesting, they saw that it was 200. Boom, it's off the shelf. It's gone. Like in Canada, do they do third party testing for like supplements, things like that before they hit the market? Definitely the big companies are going to be going through third party testing to make yeah. sure like it, and the biggest thing with third party testing. I know there was a scandal in the U.S., but I'm sure it's happened in Canada, too. What companies were doing with protein is what they were claiming on the label was not actually true to the protein content because they were doing something called amino spiking. So that's essentially where, let's say they advertised, yeah, our one scoop has 25 grams of whey isolate protein. When it got tested for third party, you know, the content of protein per serving was coming back at like 12 grams. Half of that, they were doing amino spiking, which is essentially where you fill the product with amino acids. But since amino acids are basically a protein or they have the nitrogen of protein in them, they were getting passed as 25 grams of protein per scoop. So the consumer's thinking, oh, I'm meeting my daily protein requirements when really half of that was amino spiked. You're just filling yourself with amino acids. And when it comes to protein, I noticed that I could only have protein whey isolate. I can't yeah. have any other type of protein or it just destroys my guts. Incredible yeah. pain, gas, everything. What, what is the differences between the proteins? Yeah. So awesome question. So when the best way I describe the difference between the two is you want to picture isolate protein as the most purified version through the filtration process. So essentially when a whey complex, still a good protein, like if, if people can digest it and they're fine with it, still a good quality source, it's going to have some isolates in there. You know, it's not to say there's no isolates, but it's going to be more fillers, sugars, and fats. So a lot of time where people run into stomach issues, maybe yourself included, is there's going to be a lot more lactose in there due to the fillers, right? So the more lactose you have and you're downing it, probably going to cause some stomach upset. Difference between the isolate is in the, it's one kind of step conversion over. 
they essentially remove all those fillers, sugars, fats, and carbs. So now you're just left with protein in its most purified form, hence the name isolate. You're actually getting more protein per serving too. So if you look at any complex protein, usually give or take, it's about 20, 22 to 24 grams per scoop. Some of our isolates actually go up to 30 grams per scoop. Okay. All yeah. right. When I was in the shop, uh, you actually sold me some EAAs and I've never heard of EAAs before. I came in there looking for BCAAs. What is the difference between EAA and BCAA, which are branched chain amino acids? Yeah. So branched chain amino acids, that's actually fairly easy to get through diets. So, you know, things like tuna, steak, eggs, beef, essentially all your main sources of protein going to have quite a bit of branched chain amino acids. So the hot debate, you know, years ago was, oh, branched chain amino acids build muscle. And especially when you're cutting, they can retain all this muscle. I think if you're in a, in a caloric deficit, supplementing with branch chains can be beneficial to help you retain the muscle. Difference with EAAs, though, is those are essential amino acids. So basically, I don't want to say impossible, but very hard to get through diet alone. So it's been shown that by supplementing with a blend that includes essential amino acids and B, uh, branch chain amino acids, you're actually creating a better uh, protein nitrogen response for the body. So better better muscle building effects, met, uh, better muscle recovery, going to retain more muscle too. So that's why I always recommend if someone wants to invest in that category of products of branch chains, I say, if you have the money to spend, go with an essential amino acid instead. Absolutely. And just a quick shout out to one of our sponsors is ANS Performance. The great tasting uh, EAA that you sell, sold me through through your store there too. That awesome. uh, qu that quench it's it's excellent tasting i could just drink it like kool-aid it's almost like to me and if anybody is looking to start their fitness journey after watching this hit up the link that will be in the description you'll get yourself 20 percent off any ans performance supplements you know the thing i personally noticed the biggest difference because i didn't really know about essential amino acids till i started working with popeyes i was just always on on branch chains right so I remember talking with my boss about them where, you know, talking and I'm like, I'm going to give it a try. And the biggest thing I noticed, I personally like to drink them during my workouts, just makes obviously water more enjoyable when you can have some flavor to it. The biggest thing I noticed though, is just more of an endurance increase. So normally if you get like fatigued on a big day, like leg day, I find my recovery time in between sets is improved. So normally if you're like, Oh, maybe I need an extra minute rest. It's like, no, I'm, I'm ready to go. And you notice, uh, there's something called delayed onset muscle soreness. It's where you'll do a workout and then you won't really feel it like that day. It's like, Oh, did, did I train hard enough? Like, did I, did I give every rep? And then the next day it's like, it's, for those of you who train legs, you'll know maybe on yeah. that day, you're not feeling it the day after it's like, okay, I did them hard enough. Nice thing with EAAs, you'll definitely notice a decrease in like your recovery time. So let's say normally it's like three, four days you're feeling it. Nice thing with EAAs, you know, you're, your recovery time might be, or that delayed onset muscle soreness might only last one to two days. So the recovery time is sped up, endurance between your sets is increased, and just overall better muscle uh, building effects and muscle sparing effects. And that's a good point to make because a lot of people hate doing legs because they're walking around like Frankenstein the next day. Yeah, <laughs> I know I do. I hate for, I hate leg day anyway, but because it's just because of that because I'm walking around stiff legged, having a hard time getting up and down my steps. Yeah, but for sure. yeah, that EAA will definitely help with that. If somebody is first starting their fitness journey, what do you, what would you recommend, if any supplement for them to start taking? Oh man, there's, there's so much on the market and like, you know, that's the biggest thing people come to me like, man, like I remember when I competed and, uh, the first question, it was mostly coming from dudes in the gym. You know, we all start working out cause we want to attract the nice gym bunnies, but, uh, Mostly dudes coming up to me like, man, what, what are you taking to get so shredded? It was, it was like it, as if I had this secret pill that I was going to give them like, here you go. It was never what's your diet? What's your nutrition like? People just want like, I need a supplement that's going to make me big or I need something that's going to get me shredded. You need to prioritize your you, you want to look at it as like a pyramid, right? People have it backwards. They're putting their supplements first. They're putting their training second, nutrition third and their sleep last. Like you could take every supplement under the sun, but if you're not sleeping properly, you're not eating properly, you, you might as well just flush your money because that's, it's going to waste, right? So biggest thing I tell people is prioritize your nutrition first. Then we can talk about adding in supplements. So 
you know, if it's a beginner coming in and they're trying to put on size and strength, I rec and they want a little more energy, but they can't like say afford a pre-workout. I'll say have a cup of coffee pre-workout or a caffeine pill because you know, they're both super cheap options, a good quality whey protein. You know, if you can stomach a complex, awesome, if not, and you have the money spend on an isolate and creatine monohydrate like that. Those basics I think are pretty awesome to get started. You, you know, then you have your everyday supplements, like, your, you know, your multivitamins, fish oils and, and things like that. And I, I take a multivitamin to meet the micronutrient needs, help with joint support, you know, the digestive enzymes. But I think to really get started, you know, just those like three basic, like a whey protein, creatine and caffeine, you get some pretty good results. That's where I suck is my kitchen should be full of protein jars from the amount that I've bought and then just taken a few scoops and maybe it was too chalky. Maybe I just, you know, lost the, the, the rhythm of doing it. Like I just can't seem, I have never yet gone to the very end of, of a jar of protein. I I'm yet to do it. So it's, uh, that's where I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's more of just like this chalky taste and I just like, fuck it. I'm, I'm a water guy. I just pound waters and, and that's about it. But I mean, is there any, tips on how to maybe make uh protein taste better or, yeah, or kind of alter it like when, when i was dieting right or cutting recently i just finished my cut like mid-march so i'm focused on building building season now but i would always find ways to like get creative with protein make stuff taste better i eat cottage cheese i know that might be kind of weird to some people but uh i don't mind it we we carry something at popeye's called walden farm it's like a calorie free sugary free uh like syrup so, you know, throwing some like protein powder in your oatmeal with some Walden Farms, it's like you're, it's almost like you're eating a dessert, but okay. a healthy one for you, right? Like you don't even taste the protein. Well, you taste it, but it's so much more enjoyable than trying to slug it back. Like you said, because some protein does not mix worth shit at all. Like yeah. there's some out there like that you're just shaking constantly. It's like you could have a blender bottle or like a, a whisk it's like it's not mixing usually with isolates that's i've never you know had complaints about that but uh i think mixing with oatmeal or something you can enjoy it'll make trying to actually get through the full tub that much easier yeah you don't necessarily have to mix it with just water or milk you can mix it with a food i guess and if it uh if it'll mix properly into it yeah, yeah for sure and you know like the biggest way i see nutrition now i i used to be very strict with it it was like even when I was trying to build muscle, it's like, no, I had to stick to the ground beef, the, the rice, the sweet potato. It's like, what if there was a better approach to this? And then I got looking around, it's, it's approach called if it fits your macros, flexible dieting. So when we talk about macros, we're looking at protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Protein is protein, fat is fat, carbohydrates, is carbohydrates. Is that to say certain foods aren't better for you than others? No, like obviously we know certain foods are going to help us perform better, feel mentally better. But for instance, if I can make, you know, a small blizzard from Dairy Queen fit my last remaining macros for the day, why, why can't I eat it? Like, where in the textbook, like, you know, wh why is it we are still preaching this bro science or some people are that no, you, you can't have the ice cream. And then that's where I step and I say, okay, well, why? It's got 70 carbs, which is the same amount as, you know, a cup and a half of oatmeal. It's got 16 fat, which is a few tablespoons of peanut butter, and it's got, you know, 10 grams of protein. Who's to say, like, what? where's the textbook writing that says, if I eat this, my physique's going to look worse? Yeah. That's like for, right. For me, though, like, uh, I guess binge eating was always a, a huge problem for me. And it's always, you know, sugary, salty, like, you know, at nighttime when it's the worst time to, to eat shit like that. If I feel like if I if I'm going clean, right, like right now, I haven't been eating anything, anything sugary. I, I, I feel like it's almost like if I take a little bit, some some kind of sugary treat and have it, it it's going to be like putting crack into my system. And then I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to be able to contain myself and then I'm going to get right back into those bad habits. You know what I mean? Yeah. So very interesting. You mentioned that. And that's a there's that we see what's called yo-yo dieting which is there's the concept of, you know, a building phase and then a leaning out phase, then there's yo-yo dieting. So the difference is yo-yo dieting is where people will, you know, binge on a ton of stuff. They'll gain a ton of weight and they'll rapidly lose the weight. They'll gain it all. And, and there's, there's stories you hear of, you know, men and women, more so women, I think they might have a little bit, you know, struggle a little more with this, 
but you hear some people struggling with this condition of yo-yo dieting for like 10, 15 years because they, they just, they can't break the cycle. In terms of binge eating, I think that comes down to how much did you deprive yourself on your weight loss journey? So this, I'll give a prime example. I'll go back to when I competed the first time. I decided I was going to give my, it was my first show. So I, I did the standard 20 week prep or five months. And I started off really well. Like I was still eating carbohydrates. I was still performing well in the gym, but then it kind of messes with you psychologically, right? You're eight weeks out now. It's like, I'm not looking lean enough. It's time to, you know, pull the trigger and go even harder after the show though. So now there's no deadline. There's no deadline for me to meet August 19th, the day of the show it's over. I don't need to look a certain way. So I stayed pretty strict for a month. Then I remember there's one night I came home from the gym I think, and it's like five years ago. I think my parents were making pizza and I thought, yeah, I'll have a slice. What's one slice going to do? Then you talk about, it was like, it was like literally a drug dealer just introducing something new to his body. Mm-hmm. One slice turned into like five or six. There, there's something called fuck it mode that a lot of people can <laughs> die. So I had, so I thought, okay, one slice won't hurt. So now I'm at five slices. I, I literally went full fuck it mode. I thought, well, I've already done the damage. Might as well do more because why not? Half a box of cookies gone, few, you know, little chocolate bars, Snickers bars. And then I remember there was carrot cake left over in the freezer for my birthday. And then half the carrot cake's gone. Mm-hmm. And then you just wake up the next day and feel horrible. So that was what I had to get out of because I actually struggled with that for a good like two to three months post show of like, I'm going to be clean all week. Boom. Weekend comes. I can't control myself. And it, 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 the interesting thing is like, it wasn't even physical hunger. I don't think it was even psychological. I was just in such this state that like, whatever, might as well just, but then once I kind of shifted my approach to not cutting foods, I enjoyed, I've had no rebound since then. I've had no major like binge disorder episodes because of that. When you first started competing, what did that look like? What was that training schedule like? Oh, it was nuts. Like I had no coach. Um, Honestly, everything I did was just based off of online forms or this guy or this guru said this. So the training was like, it it was your standard like bodybuilding split. I usually hit every muscle group during that time, like once a week, but a lot of volume too. And especially when you're cutting like that, your recovery time is going to not be as good as if you were in a healthy state of a caloric surplus or maintenance because you're depriving the body of nutrients essentially. Right. So there was all the training. And then I got, I peaked way too early for that show. I remember I was like eight weeks out and people were like, dude, you could step on stage right now. You could do really well, but I didn't want to take that advice because I was determined to follow these gurus. I lost a ton of muscle. The cardio I was doing was stupid. Like I, I, here I am thinking I need to do an hour of cardio fasted every morning When in reality, it's like I could have probably done cardio maybe three days a week, still hit my caloric deficit and done it properly. There's like the right way. There's the wrong way, too. What are some good resources for our listeners to consult if they because it's the holiday season coming up and people tend to eat a little bit extra at this time? What's some good resources that they could could look into about how they could start their own training regimen here? For sure. So uh, Lane Norton, uh, he's like a he got his PhD in nutritional sciences, like biochemistry. I actually bought his contest prep book and I followed that advice on this cut to kind of help me. And then I also have an app he made. It's called Carbon Diet Coach. So what I love about this app versus something like My Fitness Pal is it lays out everything for you. It says select your goal. It, it help kind of you know analyze your metabolism where you're at metabolically. Are you coming out of a cut? Are you trying to maintain or what are you doing? That's a really good resource. And then YouTube too. So just finding the right resources. Like if people just want to, you know, best beginner bodybuilding split or best five day workout split, you got to make it fit your schedule. That's where, you know, earlier we talked about the balance of things. So if someone can only get to the gym three days a week, they might be better off doing a full body workout those three days. But if someone can make it to the gym five days a week, then yeah, you're probably going to be able to get away with, you know, training each body part with intensity, a lot of volume, you know, once a week. You YouTube's a big one, like with how yeah. much is exploding with like new and upcomers and things like that. I definitely recommend Lane Norton. Uh, Jeff Nippard makes awesome stuff about training. And there's so many eBooks now you can buy too. Like all these guys have some kind of training program and you can go. And if you don't want to spend the money on that, cause you're not ready to invest, you know, I totally get it. 
you can literally just go on Google. And like I said, type in beginner workout split or three, three day a week bodybuilding split kind of thing. And say I was just lazy and all I was doing, I just wanted to watch this YouTube video and I wanted to know three exercises that I could start that would be most beneficial. What would they be? I just want to say the big three. So your squats, deadlift and bench, like those major compound lifts to like really build up the foundation of the body. Those are going to be huge. Um, I love my accessory movements because I love getting a good pump. I love getting a good stretch. So I, I'm really big into like chest flies. Um, recently started incorporating bench press back into my training, kind of laid off it for a while. But I think those top three, like if you're squatting, you know, squats, deadlifts and bench, those three are like the king of all. Sometimes I find myself like at work here. I didn't have exercise equipment. So I just started doing body weight exercises. I would do uh, dips on the side of my bed. I would do a yep. hundred pushups and then I would do uh, jumps and, and sometimes burpees. How beneficial is that versus weight training? I think it's a good start um, or it can be beneficial for some people, but anytime you're really trying to build muscle or, you know, get bigger, really tone and shape the body, you're, you're going to have to throw in some resistance on there. It's, it's really the only way to grow. And, you know, the thing is people will go, they'll wonder why maybe after a year they're not seeing the results. It's like, well, are you doing new, are you progressing in reps each week? Oh, no, I don't think so. Are you adding five pounds to the bar every, you know, three weeks? Because a lot of people think they're going to put on 20 pounds to the bar every week. It's like, that's highly unrealistic. Unless you have God-given genetics, you're not adding 20 pounds to your bar every week. But by progressively overloading, right, by adding more weight, more reps. So let's say one week I hit 60 pounds on shoulder press for 10 reps, but the next week I hit it for 11 or 12, I can say I've gotten stronger on that exercise, right? I've gotten stronger. But then if like the next week you go up to 65 pounds and you've hit, instead of hitting it for 12, you only hit it for seven or eight reps, you still got stronger because you hit it for, sorry, different weight, but for the same reps that you did last week kind of thing. And how important is it to keep your body guessing by changing it up like that? So I used to, I used to program hop all the time. I remember I'd be like, cause I used to be under the impression that you could gain one pound of muscle a week and all these, uh, you know, these programs you follow, Hey, buy my program, gain one pound. It's like unrealistic. It's definitely important to, you know, change your training, but I think you really need to give it at least eight to 12 weeks before you actually assess your progress. So the program I'm following right now, it's a really high volume one. Um, so volume refers to the amount of uh, sets you're doing. And then in the, and there's the reps too. So I'm doing a lot of volume, a lot of sets for a decent amount of reps. And I'm doing each body part once a week. But I'm not going to start another program for at least another, you know, three, four months. Because if I'm continuing to see progress and I'm getting stronger, my lifts are all going up. What like What's the need to program hop, right? If I'm looking better and I'm feeling better, performing better, there's no need to be jumping. Oh, I did this for two weeks. I'm going to do this three weeks. You don't know what's working. If you're feeling the benefits and seeing the benefits. Yeah. There's no need to change, like, I guess. I stop, right? break, you know, don't they, fix it. Yep. Yeah. Don't, what is, what's it saying? Like don't fix what ain't broke or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. So, so if I'm, if I'm pro like progressing, why am I going to fix that? Like, why yeah. am I going to, Oh, do you guess it's time for a change? When it comes to testosterone, when is it in a male's body that we start seeing that decrease and it's a little bit harder for us to get those gains? Yeah. So, you know, the general age is, I mean, nowadays, like we're actually in like a testosterone decline. It's like young males we're seeing in like in their twenties. And it's like, well, why? It's like, we look, we got to look at the, the foods we're eating a lot more processed, you know, eating from or heating up plastics, like if you're heating up your food, drinking from plastic water bottles, I always try to use the BPA free ones. Um, but I want to say generally like test declines around 30 to 35, but it's happening to young males. It happened to me too. You know, I don't mind sharing this because customers come in, ask all the time. So I'm cool sharing it. I'd gone to my doctor with, you know, just all like all the symptoms of low test, but unfortunately a lot of general practitioners don't really know what to look for. So I went from like extremely motivated, you know, ready to tackle the day to just not motivated, just like feeling depressed for no reason. And of course, my doctor's first line of defense is here, we'll just throw you on antidepressants. We'll see how it works. And I said, oh, I'm not taking that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm not touching that, but thanks anyway. 
So, you know, through doing my own research, I was kind of able to interpret my own blood work and where my level should be for, you know, I was 23 or 24 at the time I went through all this. And I was like, oh my God. So this is the medical reference range. And by the way, it it's outdated. Like, you, you know, doctors are saying, you know, a 90 year old man walks in, he gets his levels tested. He's at a 200 free testosterone. Then you get a 23 year old. He's at a 200 free test. You're going to tell me the 20 year old with the free test of 200 is healthy compared to a 90 year old. Like, no. So I looked at my numbers after learning how to interpret it. I'm like, Oh my God, like I'm this low and I'm, but I'm in the medical reference range. So keep in mind in in Canada, I'm healthy. So I'm like, I'm not going to live like this, you know, feeling like this all the time. So yeah, I took certain test boosting ingredients. There, there are ones that work, you know, like your fenugreeks, your boron, things like that. Definitely um, tightened up my diet a bit, incorporated more saturated fats, quality carbohydrates. And then honestly, within three months, I was able to go from super low feeling awful to feeling fantastic in three months. And then me being me wanting to keep experimenting and go even further, I was able to even double that number. So a a six month journey. Were you able to get on TRT? No, no. So personally, like I'm young still, I'm 25. So I wouldn't, uh, Yeah, I haven't even considered it. Um, I, I didn't need to based on the products I took and like the blood work I saw, I was like, okay, those actually worked, right? The products, because like some test boosters, I will say are underdosed, you know, like for certain ingredients to work, it's not so much the ingredient, it's dose dependent. A lot of these test boosters, they'll underdose their stuff. People wonder why they still feel the same or, oh, it didn't do anything for me because it's dose dependent. You know, you take an ingredient like fenugreek, the clinical trials were using a thousand milligrams on, on males per day. And then after three months, they saw these drastic boosts. So it's like a lot of these test boosters might only have 200. So you're taking 10 times less the clinical dose needed to see results. I mean, you know, in terms of TRT, like I haven't, you know, I feel great now uh, most days. So I haven't even like considered that very hard to get into Canada. Like it's, uh, you, you would have to be like basically at the lowest of the low on the free testosterone, how they measure or lower for a doctor to even prescribe that. It's almost like it's become this scary topic for doctors to prescribe. You know, they'll prescribe everything else under the sun that causes all these detrimental effects. But when it comes to a a hormone optimization that, like I said, once I got my levels up, my, and a lot of people, they like, oh, it's just for the muscle you're doing it. It's like, no, my mental health shot up greatly. Life felt amazing again. Confidence skyrocketed. Why is this not being talked about? It's like, oh, if you take tests to optimize, you are this, you're doing this. And it's, it's like, no, like. The amount of people I've talked to, guys who do it for mental health and just to feel that quality of life, obviously the muscle gains, you know, the uh, gym performance is a benefit, but Mm -hmm. who doesn't want higher tests? Who doesn't want to see that blood work and be like, oh, it's working. Yeah, that's the route that I'm taking. Uh, Just even when you mentioned uh, being offered antidepressants from a doctor, I mean, they they have to be getting some fat bonuses for giving that out because they give it out so quickly. You know, 100%. He didn't even ask me. Like no questions were asked about like, you know, my doctor, I don't even see him anymore, but he gives me shit for taking creatine because it rots your kidneys. And it's like, I said to him, I said, it's funny. I said, why is it every time you make me get blood work, my liver enzymes, kidney functions all come back as excellent or optimal, yet you keep touting this um, rhetoric, you know, purporting on this one side that's going to kill my kidneys. And of course he, you know, no docs, but they're wrong. It was like, uh, you just got lucky. Come see me in 10 years. It's like, well, I've been using it for eight years now and I'm doing just fine. So, but you talk about them giving out stuff so quickly. So no questions were asked about my diet lifestyle factors. Was I in a stressful job? Cause before Papa, I was in a job. I just couldn't stand, but no questions were asked about that. It was like, here you go. Come see me in three months. And when I told them, no, I don't want to. I, and I, I was honest. I said, well, this is the testosterone booster I'm going to use. This is what it's called. And when I told him the ingredients in it, there was nothing unnatural about it. Okay. It wasn't like a pro hormone or anything like that. But when I told him the ingredients, he goes, Oh, those sound dangerous. I said, well, why? He goes, Oh, just the name, just the name of those ingredients is enough to make me think they're dangerous. But the antidepressant you were about to give me, Mm -hmm. what are the side effects of that? Like, right. Yeah. I I had uh... exactly. 
I went through a process uh, just because I, I wanted to fix my mental health. And I mean, I was looking everywhere except for fitness in the first place. But yeah. when I started going through and speaking to people, um, like a lot of the the nurses and things uh, asking me questions about what kind of drugs I'm taking, what medications that I'm on, and I tell them nothing. And and the shock, they're like, really, you don't take anything? It, it made me wonder like, wow, shit, is, is 99% of the population taking something right now? You know, it's they, uh, they are like we're yeah. It's crazy to me. We're you know, especially in Thunder Bay now. You see pot shop after pot shop after pot shop opening. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't do it. Am I against yeah. people who do? No, just not my not my choosing. Doesn't really suit my lifestyle. But interesting, you see pot shop after pot shop popping up on every corner. You know, I can go to any Max, any gas station. Give me a pack of smokes. Give me that. No problem. So. Health Canada, so the same Health Canada that's approving all these, you know, cigarettes, nicotine products, pot, alcohol, it's the same organization that bans peptides from coming into Canada. So there, there's one on the market right now. It's a super, it's a, it's still technically research, but the studies they've done on it is just like, wow, like the results people are seeing is called BPC-157. It's a healing peptide. So there have been people who had like plantar fasciitis, just extreme arthritis. It's it's an injectable, right? They've injected this peptide. Within 48 hours, almost all symptoms were relieved. Oh, wow. So it's like, what, <laughs> you know, products that are essentially killing people, alcohol, nic like, well, not so much nicotine, but like cigarettes in general, all these carcinogens, even the food we're eating, fine and dandy, put them on the grocery shelves, put them in the gas stations but a peptide that is actually healing people without super negative consequences. Because even if you look at the painkillers doctors are prescribing, what people don't realize about prescriptions, they are a band-aid. There's a reason you keep getting your prescription refilled. It is, it's, if, if I have a cut and I let it heal naturally, it's going to heal. I'm fine. If you keep putting a band-aid over it, ripping it off, putting it on, it's going to take longer. So with prescriptions, right? Oh, my back pain's gone. Okay, I went off for a month. Now I got to get my prescription filled. It's a never-ending cycle. So my question is, why is it? Why is the alternative route of healing peptides? Why is that not being talked about? Why is it not being discussed openly? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's almost like they want to keep us sick and dependent yeah. on their medications. That's, that's where the money comes from. Yeah. 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 Because yep. I mean, I've uh, I've never. Uh, taken any antidepressants but the way i look at it is it's almost like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks i mean there's no cure right they're saying we're going to start you off with this we're going to see how it goes and then you find maybe hey i feel great but i mean from what i'm hearing is it's almost like your body's getting used to that dose and eventually it's not going to be working so great anymore you know and then yeah. and then they up the dosage or you know like uh, the, the and rather than give you advice, like, hey, man, why don't you go out and take a fucking walk, you know, once in a while, you know, oh, the, it's, the... <laughs> like it's crazy. To me, Like people are like, always questioning, like, oh, why is society getting more run down more than ever? Why is testosterone on the decline? Why are why are we seeing obesity rates? You know, people in Canada, we always used to blame the states and say, oh, the U.S. has such an obesity crisis. It's like we are not far behind. And if anything, we are definitely catching up. So. You know, it's funny, like it's it's never discussed with doctors about why don't you go outside and get some vitamin D or, you know, why don't you go for a walk? Why don't you consider losing that 20 pounds? It's like, here's your stuff. See you in six months. Yeah. Yeah. What are some ways that we could boost our testosterone without doing any supplements or anything? What are some natural ways without taking TRT or any of that? Like, what are some natural ways that you could boost like I heard zinc or magnesium, stuff yeah. like that. Was there so, any type of foods or anything that also help? Yeah. So, I mean, the whole zinc magnesium thing, there's, there's a supplement called ZMA, which is zinc, magnesium, vitamin B6. It's, off, it's usually taken in the evening about 30 minutes to an hour before bed. And I've supplemented with it and it, it does help you sleep. So when it first came out in the 90s, of course, it was like boost your testosterone by this much percent. Your testosterone and growth hormone goes up while you're sleeping. Okay. So when you take something like ZMA, it's not so much the product that's boosting your testosterone, it's because it's putting you in a better state of sleep. So your testosterone is going to be optimized. So, you know, natural ways to do it. You can take certain ingredients like, yeah, okay, your zinc, magnesium, 
Boron's a really good one uh, to free up testosterone, unbind it from your sex hormone binding globulin, but things like diet. So, you know, less processed foods, that's going to be a big one. So uh, when I say processed, I'm not referring to like a can of tuna. I'm talking your like your Cheetos, Doritos, um, pastries, um, the loves cookies. of my life. <laughs> <laughs> here I am saying all the ways to like optimize yeah. it. I'm just getting triggered over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about cookies, but no, I, th- I think that's the biggest one is like eliminate or cutting back. I don't want to say eliminate, but cutting back on processed food, eating more uh, saturated fats in moderation. You don't want too much of it because you're you know, heart health too. Things like salmon, like healthy omega threes in the in the fish we eat. Ground beef is a great option too, but I think um, optimizing your body fat percentage too, that's another huge one that's not really talked about. So oftentimes like the big thing is, oh, the leaner you get, the more testosterone you have uh, to, to use, which is true, but there's, it's very interesting for men. A lot of people think, oh, the leaner I get, the more testosterone to have. I like to call it the cutoff point and I've experienced it before. So generally a male is going to feel his best at about one is everyone's different, but like the, the threshold will be like 10 to 15% body fat, let's say. Once you start getting into those single digits, like eight, seven, six percent stage ready, that's when testosterone is going to take a hit. Other end of the scale, when you get above, you know, that 15, 20, 25%, that's when we're going to also see testosterone decline. So I think healthy weight management is going to be number one, adequate sleep. Um, the big three lifts that we talked about, squats, deadlift, bench press, have been shown to help with like testosterone production. And just overall living like a balanced lifestyle, you know, cutting back on alcohol if you can. Um, a lot of studies are finding cigarette smokers, unfortunately, um, that can have an issue on testosterone. I don't know what the direct correlation is. Um, I know that it can, you know, reduce blood flow down to that area. So if you don't want to run into th- those issues, maybe consider stopping smoking or cutting back. But just like lifestyle factors that would be general knowledge, like drink less, you know, don't smoke as much. Um, just optimizing your overall nutrition and um, lifestyle factors. I think that's a big one. Then if you actually need it, like I was optimizing everything, my levels weren't budging. That's when I made the choice. Okay, I'm going to buy this test booster. I'm going to use it for three months and then we'll see. And then, so I think if you need something like a good test booster, yeah, it'll, it'll do wonders for you. So like three, three weeks ago, I got my testosterone levels and they, they were cons- done here. In, yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. Got them done in town and they were considered high. I still want to push it. I want to get a little bit more. So I went and picked up something called ashwagandha. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. So I've, I've used it a few times. There's, there's a lot of controversy surrounding ashwagandha because there's been reports of like guys who've taken mega doses, like 1300, 1500 milligrams a day. Then they report their emotions are dull. So now it's almost like yeah. acting as a, now it's almost acting as an SSRI, like antidepressant. Like, you know, I experimented with the, the standard dose that comes in product, the 600 milligrams. And I'm not saying everyone's going to react, but I, I, for me, I could not do the 600 milligrams. I just felt like, again, this was when my testosterone was already low when I was at my old job. So I can't just blame the ashwagandha. So I will, will say that, but it can kind of like put you into a state of things don't feel as exciting anymore. Things don't feel, um, as sad anymore. You're just kind of like, even you feel blue. Interesting though. Um, I found a test booster. I bought it online again, before I was with Popeye's, it only had 300 milligrams per daily serving. Once I dropped from the 600 and I cut the dose in half, I felt amazing. Yeah. Cause I'm taking, I'm taking 600 right now and I'm feeling amazing at three weeks. So that that's interesting. You mentioned that. So I think everyone, everyone responds differently to drugs. And that's what people in the bodybuilding fitness community don't really understand. Like for me, like I said, I'm have no plans to take TRT at like, I mean, 25, like if I had to, if I had to in my forties, okay. But the reason I didn't, everyone was just saying, man, if your levels are low, just do TRT, do TRT. It's like, what if there's a different approach? Like, what if I take the natural route first through the supplements, like I mentioned. So if I can get them to that high level naturally, what I have no, again, we talk about reason and cause for things. If I have no reason to do it, I'm not going to. But once I dropped to that 300 milligrams of ashwagandha, I was like, wow, like I just, I feel better. So that's where I'm talking about. Everyone responds differently. You could give me 200 milligrams of testosterone injection a week and I could see great results. 
someone else could take 200 milligrams a week and feel nothing right? or see nothing. It's, it's dose dependent. Everyone responds different. Biggest thing I will say, there are certain supplements that need to be cycled. So things like your fat burners, um, don't want to be using those more than eight weeks because the body will adapt to the stimulants in there. Things like testosterone boosters, essentially you want to follow like an eight week on protocol, uh, one to two months off. I did a three month when I did mine, cause that's what the company said you could do. And then I went off for two months completely. But I think even with something like ashwagandha, those are like, it's a herbal supplement, right? So you don't want to build up that tolerance to it. I think with ashwagandha, anything like a four week, well, four to eight weeks on followed by four weeks off, that's going to work wonders. Yeah. That's what I was thinking was eight weeks. Cause I was planning on having my blood done again in a week's time. So I'll make it one month and then compare my testosterone levels as well. And I can already say like, it melts the stress off of you as well. Like I've noticed that already taking place, I'm feeling a lot more relaxed. And it says it does that by dropping your cortisol levels. Correct. Yeah. So a lot of people will take ashwagandha before bed. Sometimes they'll take like a higher dose, like that 600. Maybe some people even go higher. Not so much because it's put, it's not like something like melatonin where it's going to help you fall asleep faster and stay asleep. It's reducing that stress and anxiety and cortisol. So it makes it that much easier to unwind at the end of the day. I was actually wondering, uh, because you hear so many different things online, uh, you don't know what is, you know, good advice. Online can be be your best friend or worst enemy when it comes to fitness. Yeah, it could be a cesspool, right? So, I mean, like for me, uh, waking up in the morning, I want to get my workout done in the morning because I don't like uh, screwing over future Mark and putting it on him when he gets back from work and he's tired and all that shit, right? So I want to get it out of the way. Now, what, is it better for me? And I mean, I'm a pretty big guy and I'm trying to just lose the weight, tone down a little bit, not really lose muscle. But if I'm waking up and within, you know, the first half hour of my morning, I'm starting, you know, on the elliptical and, and going like, should I be eating protein before or before I do that workout 30 minutes before? Because I'm afraid if I'm just not eating and getting on the elliptical, am I just like burning that, you know, losing muscle? Yeah, that's so a great question. That's a great question. Very good question. So that, that's been a hot topic as well. So th- there's a few ways we can look at that. If you're waking up, not eating anything and going all in and doing fasted hit cardio, which is high intensity interval training. So that's where you'd be going like all out bike sprints, let's say for 30 seconds, followed by 30 uh, minute rest. Yeah. And especially if you're, tr- you know, that's going to be a recipe for muscle wasting um, and muscle loss, essentially. But if you're just doing steady state cardio, like, is that, is that what you're doing right now? Just like right now. Yeah. Like I've got some free weights there that I haven't incorporated yet because I'm just trying to get into the rhythm of getting up, doing something and, and uh, doing the, the cardio part is what I enjoy kind of the most because I can put something on the screen and just zone out and and push, you know, for sure. So I think in, in your case of doing, like you said, that moderate pace on the elliptical, since you're not really going with that much intensity, causing you to feel just like absolutely gassed, chances of muscle loss are going to be slim. Now there are ways around it. If you want to go the supplemental route, um, you could, su- for fasted cardio, you could just even, instead of essential amino acids, you could just take a scoop of branch chains on to be on the safe side to prevent, you know, muscle catabolism, muscle breakdown. But I think as long as you're eating something after like a protein rich meal, maybe some carbohydrates as well, provided it fits into your meal plan, whatever you might be following, Mm -hmm. Uh, provided you're eating that protein and then the carbohydrates to replenish any lost glycogen stores. Yeah. The the chances of major muscle loss can be very, very slim. Like you'd have to be going all out elliptical, like as fast as you could for 30 seconds and doing that for like long periods of time. Okay. And for like protein, like I'm an egg guy in the morning. I love eggs and eggs, you know, one year they're, they're, they're horrible for you. The next year they're great. You know, like uh, a doctors I'm hearing are are taking like, you know, eating four eggs in the morning and, and for years, no problems. Where do you stand on eggs? I actually didn't touch on this earlier in the podcast, but growing up, you know, my mom's a dietitian uh, by profession. So, you know, healthy eating was obviously like instilled from an early age. So it's not like I was never not allowed to treat or anything, but I think by developing those healthy habits at an early age, seeing what she was able to do for me and for herself, that really influenced like where I'm at now with things. I, I had this talk with my, with my mom the other day about eggs, actually. She even told me the other day, studies are kind of now showing that uh, it's not so much the dietary cholesterol that we're consuming from eggs. When people are running to heart problems with these high fat diets you hear about, it's the dietary fats that we're consuming. So things like red, too much red meat, 
yes, it, it's going to cause, it can, if you're predisposed to it, can cause heart problems, you know, problems with the arteries, but no, like two, three eggs a day, I think, I think is great. I okay. love eggs. Good. Another thing people are always questioning too, is when to take their protein and creatine before the workout or after the workout protein, you know, when you're training, right, you're breaking down the muscle. So a lot of people think you grow in the gym, right? I used to be under that impression. You grow when you're resting and recovering. So in the gym, you're beating up the muscle, you're breaking it down. So by taking like a fast acting protein after the gym, such as an isolate, you're helping rebuild that muscle tissue that you broke down. So essentially it's repairing the damage. So ideally with protein, like an isolate, you're going to want to take post-workout. There is something called casein protein as well, which is a slow digesting protein, which is found in cottage cheese actually, or you can get it in powder form. Casein though is going to be digested over the course of six to eight hours. So I'm a big fan of casein powder or casein protein powder, or cottage cheese, like an hour before bed, because essentially you're going six to eight hours in a fasted state. So if you're having something like a casein, it's digesting over the course of six to eight hours in the bud, bloodstream. So you're getting that steady stream of amino acids and protein, the building blocks for muscle repair and recovery, right? So with protein, if you're, if you're working out, you know, damage the muscle. Yeah. Ideally post post workout would be your best bet. Interesting thing with creatine, it has something called a saturation effect. Okay. So creatine is not going to be something like caffeine where you take it instantly 30 minutes later, I'm ready to go. I can lift the world. Okay. Creatine has to saturate the muscle because it naturally elevates your ATP levels when you take it, which is your adenosine triphosphate, the body's natural energy source. Okay. So when you take creatine, you're essentially ramping up your ATP production to signal more strength during your workouts. You're going to be able to hit a few more reps. You're going to get stronger over time. But when I say saturation effect, it takes time to build up in the system creatine. So the, the standard protocol is going to be five grams a day. So if you, if you, if someone takes five grams a day, first thing when they wake up, the muscle cells are going to be fully saturated after about a month of use, all right, of creatine use. Then we hear about the loading phase of creatine where right. you take 10 to 15 grams for that first week and you cycle back down to a maintenance dose. So if you're a little bit more impatient, you want it to work quicker, then yeah, you're going to want to load it. Timing of day doesn't so much matter. It's more about when, how consistent can you be and when are you going to remember to take it? So if someone has their creatine, they say, hey, I'm going to wake up and take my five grams right now and I'll take my second five grams post-workout awesome. But it, it's with creatine, it's not like, you know, you hear all these guys mixing the creatine and with their pre-workout thinking it has this instantaneous effect. It does not. So whether I take my five grams in the morning and you take your five grams pre whoever is more consistent and remembers to take it on the daily, that's when creatine works the best. Okay. So it's about keeping that muscle saturated as opposed yes. to when, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Just keeping, yeah. Keeping it on a schedule. That's good to know. And one more thing, how much of a break or rest are you taking between sets? So say I, I hammered out 10, 12 reps. How long should I be resting before yeah. I should do my next set? Yeah. So on my compound lifts, personally, like squats, I, I rest two minutes. Sometimes if I feel the need, I'll rest three. Generally, I don't tr like to rest three minutes. I feel like I'm just taking up the squat rack at the gym and I don't want to be that guy. And personally, I just, I want to get hammer out my next set. So generally on my compound lifts, like squats, deadlifts, bench, I'll rest two minutes. Um, and then even on incline dumbbell press, I kind of did something to my shoulder. I think I like to give it about two minutes, but on the lighter movements, like, you know, uh, chest flies, pec decks, only a minute tops. Do you stretch before and after workouts? Is it something I, important to do? I need, it's very important. I don't do it though. And I think that's why I've, I've, I have never had any major injuries, uh, knock on wood. Um, but I think though, as I get older though, and wanting to continue this for longevity purposes, uh, I definitely think I should incorporate some kind of foam rolling before leg day for sure. Awesome. Mike, it's been great, man. We've got a lot of information for the Ooh, listeners okay. to break down through this. We always ask our guests to, but like at the end of the episode to give a positive message, but what I would like would be like, what would you say to anybody that's, with like been hemming and hawing about starting to get more healthier starting that they've been putting it off what would you say to get them in there well the best quote i got when i first started was from one of my favorite physique competitors big big star in the right men's physique division. he said you don't have to be great to start but you have to start to be great okay oh. so to and I, I still live by that so to elaborate on that and like hoping i can inspire people like 
if you look back at old pictures of me when I started and I was 17, people were like, you, you made that transformation, but people don't realize it took eight years. I have guys coming to me. Like I had a guy I went to high school with the other day. He's like, man, like how, how long did this take? I'm like, dude, we went to high school together. So it's taken me this time frame. So he's comparing his day one journey to my eight years. This guy hasn't even been working out a year yet. And the first question he asks is, how long do I got, do I need to train to get similar results to you? And the biggest thing I'll give the viewers as a takeaway is one, nobody's you and you're not anybody else. Meaning no two bodies, no genetics are the same. Okay. Everyone's going to respond differently. So the biggest thing to like, take away is comparison is going to be the thief of joy. And I'm still guilty of that some days. And I, especially when I started, not so much now, you know, cause I'm content with what I've been able to do, but more so when I started, I would look up to my heroes and be like, Oh, this guy says he's natural. So if I eat the way he does and I train the way he does and I take the supplements he does, I'm going to look like that. Now, you know, two years go by, you're seeing results, but you still don't look like your hero. And then the truth comes out about all these guys, of course. So the biggest thing I can say is like, if you're, if you're content with the results you're seeing, it's like, who else are you trying to appease? Right? Like, why does it matter if the buddy next to you is doing 80 pounds and you're doing 60? If you're content with the way your chest and back looks, why does it matter if that guy thinks your back's not big enough? Right? Mm -hmm. So it comes down to, I think the biggest thing is like doing it for the right reason. Are you doing it for yourself? Or are you doing it for like a status to like, you know, show something? Yeah, very true. Very true. Mike, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. Before we close it up, anybody you want to give a shout out to on here? Anybody that you want to say hi to anything? Uh, huge thanks to my boss for uh, bringing me on the team last year and uh, hiring me and uh, placing a bet on me. So yeah. Popeye's been awesome. Uh, you know, I actually got uh, to go to Winnipeg for the Magnum Conference in uh, late July. So that was an incredible experience too. Uh, just all the customers who I've been able to help. So thank you for putting your trust in me. Uh, Hope everyone's continuing to see the results they're after. And shout out to ANS for sponsoring this podcast. Love the products. Yeah, nice. Thank you so much, Mike. Hey, thank you so much, guys. Have a great one. Broken Home Podcast, everybody. Have yourself a great week. Take care, everyone.